Thank you very much, Ursula. We'll hear from Doug for 15 minutes, and then we'll open the, uh, the conversation up to the room. Hello, thank you for uh, showing up and listening. Um, I brought my Hockey Hall of Fame pen as a, a <laughs> Canadian icon here. Um, uh, first, like everyone here, I want to start by expressing my affection and admiration for Leo. It's been uh, almost 20 years since we met. It was the year he and Melanie lived in New York. I, my book, Wall Street, had come out recently, and Leo wanted to talk about finance, and uh, we've been talking ever since. I've long appreciated the way he uh, combines intellectual rigor with political commitment and complexity of argument with clarity of expression, and the way he managed to be seriously radical, yet rooted in the real world, and also a very lovable friend as well. He's an inspiration to all of us doing this kind of work, studying and writing about political and economic power. I'd like to say a few words about the reconfigurations of that power in the US over the last several decades. I should say this is still pretty preliminary and uh, very much in formation. It's also uh, quite Leo appropriate because he asked me to write about the business community for the 2006 edition of the Socialist Register. As with um, all four of the pieces Leo asked me to write for the Register, uh, it made me think seriously in ways I hadn't before. This one got me started in a project I've been dancing around ever since. If I had better work habits, I'd already written my long planned book on the rot of the American ruling class. How it's gone from a coherent formation dominated by the Northeastern WASP elite in the mid 20th century one with deep social ties of marriage, school, club, and consciousness, to one primarily united by the pursuit of the maximum amount of money in the shortest possible time. This is a more sociological angle than uh, my earlier approach to studying the bourgeoisie. When I was working on that Wall Street book, oh, so long ago, I was struck by how little financial markets have to do with funding of production, their standard textbook purpose. This is especially true of the stock market, despite what a few New York, State, uh, New York Stock Exchange press officer once told me was the point of the whole uh, racket. Large corporations, the kind whose shares trade on the New York Stock Exchange, are mostly self-financed, meaning they pay for capital investments out of their profits. Yes, some firms raise cash through initial public offerings, but they're surprisingly rare, even in boom times like the late 1990s. And rather than being used to finance investment in the underlying business, the proceeds of those stock offerings were more typically used to cash out the original investors, like venture capitalists, and to provide a windfall for top managers, to create a currency that can be used for takeovers, in which shares are used for payment uh, to the targeted firm shareholders rather than cash, and to offer options on those shares to top employees. Lately, despite a venture-fueled ca uh, capital, uh, venture capital orgy of startups, IPOs have become rather rare. Last year, by finance professor uh, Jay Ritter's count, there were just 74 IPOs of any significance, compared with an average of 428 in 1999 and 2000, the era, era of now such now forgotten miracles as Pets.com, Cosmo, and Webvan. Such uh, major current names as Uber and Airbnb have preferred to remain private. Back in the dot-com days, they had been the subject of heroic IPOs. More on that in a bit. Individual IPOs aside, in the aggregate, equity markets have little or nothing to do with financing production. On the contrary, since 1982, when it became legal for corporations to buy their own stock to raise its price, a gift to senior management, which it with, uh, typically has large stock holdings, U.S. non-financial firms have devoted, on average, 17% of their internal funds, and it's profits plus depreciation, also known as cash flow, devoted 17% of their cash flow to buying their own stock and that of corporations they're taking over. Since 2000, the average is close to 20%. That's a sharp contrast with the 1952 to 81 period when firms are net issuers of new stock, meaning they were behaving according to what the uh, textbooks and NYSE press officers said. Nor is the bond market a major source of funds for production. Firms are more likely to use bonds to fund takeovers rather than capital spending. Smaller firms rely on banks for funding their operations <coughs> but not so much the big boys. So considering all of that, I wondered what these markets were all about. My conclusion was that they were more about the organization of ownership than funding production. Institutions of, in other words, owning class formation. The stock market in particular allowed the capitalist class to diversify its holdings, to own pieces of the entire productive apparatus of the economy rather than, they, than, than just specific firms, as they did in the system's early days. 
and also provided enormous liquidity, the capacity to touch their money, in Joan Robinson's phrase, or enormous convenience for rentiers, in another pearl phrase of hers. It's not very easy to sell your family's machine tool factory in an instant, but it's very easy to sell a million shares of GM with your iPhone. But something has happened over the last several decades, starting with the leveraged buyout move in the early, early 1980s. Then, a circle of what uh, Alan Greenspan once called unaffiliated corporate restructurers used gobs of borrowed money to take over or threaten to take over underperforming or what was perceived as underperforming public companies. This is the beginning of a smash in the old Galbraithian corporation of the new industrial state era. At the center of all this was Michael Milton of Drexel, Burnham, Lambert. The theorist of that movement, Harvard Business School prof Michael Jensen, declared that this represented the eclipse of the public corporation. Uh, I think that paper came out in 1989, just as it all about to go bust. The idea was that the debt would concentrate managers' mind, forcing them to cut costs, sell lagging divisions, and goose up permanent productivity. Things didn't turn out quite as planned. As the roaring 80s turned into the recessionary early 90s, that uh, shareholder movement fell apart. Milken uh, surrendered his wig and entered a federal prison, and the taken over companies collapsed under the enormous debt burdens that they'd been placed under. It looked like the public corporation was not being eclipsed after all. But after a hibernation, the takeover movement returned in the early 2000s, more respectable perhaps than it was in the Drexel days, in the form of large private equity funds. The PE juggernaut took a hit in the Great Recession, but has since come back with a roar. These PE funds are vast pools of money supplied by individuals uh, and uh, institutions run by a small team of managers. Although they sometimes start companies or fund new ones in their early stages, venture capital is a form of private equity, more typical is buying an existing company using the partnership's own funds of the equity base and then using gobs of money to complete the transaction, borrowed money to complete the transaction. The formula for success, though, is similar to the early 80s. Sell divisions, cut costs, outsource, speed up. Maybe you load up the firm with debt and pay yourself big cash dividends along the way. And then you hope to sell it a few years later, either to another private equity firm, to a competitor, or on occasion, to the public via a stock flotation. As a result of these uh, buyouts, the number of listed companies traded on a public exchange has declined by half over the last 20 years. The value of those, something like 3,000 to 1,500 now. The value of those companies has risen with the relentless bull market of the last eight years, but the uh, public companies are now dominated mostly by older firms. A striking feature of the boom in startups, the venture capital uh, funded creation of the so-called unicorns, those startups worth a billion dollars or more, names like Uber and Airbnb, the remarkable thing about it is how few have gone public. Uber is now talking about floating stock in 2019 <coughs> If it makes it there, given all his recent troubles. But that's an eternity in financial time. <coughs> the reason looks to be not wanting the bother of public shareholders telling you what to do or having to disclose your finances uh, and have them audited every quarter. Although, although the typical structure of a private equity firm is that of a limited partnership, a, very, a small circle of very well-heeled friends, one of the biggest, the Blackstone Group, went public in 2007, just before everything fell apart. Blackstone stock lost about 85% of its value over the next couple of years, but it's since, since recovered, and it's just 13% above its offering price. You have done five times as well just buying an S&P index fund. Not only has the financial performance been underwhelming, as a stockholder, you have no claim to much of anything. As the prospectus of their stock offering made clear, quote, our common unit holders will have only limited voting rights and will have no right to elect our general partner or its directors. The similar structures prevail at many high-profile uh, public, new public companies like Facebook. Blackstone's partners have made a ton of money off the offering, but their shareholders haven't. This is further proof of the old rule that you should never buy anything from someone richer than yourself. <laughs> Along with the growth of private equity, we've seen an increasing prominence of private companies. The most notorious of these are the Co as Coke Industries, owned by the people who spent well over, spent well over a billion dollars transforming the American political landscape since the 1970s. This is all interesting from a narrowly economic point of view. How corporations are owned and run is of great importance for our material welfare. But it's also politically and sociologically very interesting. 
I'd say that the rightward mood of the Republican Party over the last couple of decades has been greatly lubricated by the increasing wealth and political engagement of these private actors. They're all over government at every level, from state legislatures to the federal government. There are, as I already mentioned, the Koch brothers, who funded, much of it in great secrecy, hundreds of political candidates and scores of think tanks and institutes and universities all over across the United States. And their network of many similarly constituted magnets. One of them, Harold Hamm, a fracking billionaire, is Trump's favorite advisor on energy. He also advised the 2012 Republican presidential candidate Mitt Romney, himself a private equity man. And then there are buyout artists, too. There's Steve Schwartzman of Blackstone, a close Trump advisor. Schwartzman is the guy whose reaction to a half-hearted proposal by Obama to end a tax break enjoyed by private equity and hedge fund titans was to liken it to Hitler's invasion of Poland. Trump's Commerce Secretary, Wilbur Ross, is another one of these characters. And Robert Mercer, the hedge fund billionaire who funded the tech side of Trump's campaign and continues to fund Breitbart News, home of Steve Bannon. Trump himself ran a real estate firm with a small staff and no outside shareholders. And uh, he met uh, uh, Wilbur Ross because Ross helped him uh, work out the stiffing of his, uh, his uh, creditors. Like a, a good private equity guy, Trump loaded up his casinos with debt and pocketed much of the proceeds. You might think it's hard for casinos to go bust after all the house always wins, but Trump managed to steer his into a ditch at great personal profit to himself. Of course, you never really know for sure since he can't be trusted uh, to account for his financial affairs or anything else very accurately. What unites these guys, and all men practically, is that they don't want to answer to anyone or anything other than their own money. Many of them are in very dirty industries and hate environmental regulations because they cost them lots of money or even put them out of business. The other day, the Financial Times had a story about how institutional investors are pressing public energy companies to begin accounting seriously for the fact that their business model is doomed and their assets could be worthless in the foreseeable future. And some of the energy companies are listening, or at least pretending to. It's impossible to imagine David Koch or Howell Hamm taking this kind of advice. And so we have Trump and his EPA head, Scott Pruitt, dismantling every environmental regulation they can. This is a circle that doesn't merely want government, they don't want, they merely don't want government cramping their style, they also don't even want outside investors bothering them either. This is of great political importance, but there's also something of theoretical interest here too. Marx, Marx described the emergence of the Joint Stock Corporation with the separation of ownership and management as the abolition of the capitalist mode of production within the capitalist mode of production itself, and held, hence a self-abolishing contradiction. That process now looks to be thrown in advert, in, into reverse. Modest gains in transparency and accountability are being jumped in favor of opacity and unchecked power of private actors. I suppose this is appropriate to a period of reaction, but it doesn't really sound like a good development. I think I forgot to transcend pessimism, but I usually do. <laughs> I'll do that next time. I think I kept one of the water by 15 minutes. <laughs>